Good evening, everyone. This is Adiel Gorel. Thank you for joining us for this webinar. Today was supposed to be a live event in Colombia, uh, right near Washington, D.C. And it's for you, the wonderful donors of you bought the Life 201 package by donating to PBS. That is very nice. We very much appreciate that you've done this. As you can see, I'm calling you from the beautiful San Francisco Bay Area, where for us it's only 3 p.m. And I hope very much that just like you found value in the Life 201 package that you received for your donation, you will find value in today's call. We also have a couple of people who joined us who are not PBS donors, and I want to extend my welcome to you. And once again, this should be a very useful bit of information, just as a recap. Life 201 is a PBS special that I made with this idea. I've been in the real estate investment field for decades, and every quarter we have a big event where I speak, I teach, I bring in the market teams, but I also bring experts in fields related to real estate investing, such as lawyers and CPAs. And many years I've carried the idea of why not have an event where I can bring great experts to talk about what I care about, not in the business world, but in the real world, so to speak. And I was born very, very curious and interested in fitness, health, wellness. I think I mentioned in the book that when I just learned how to read, one of the first things I would read was my grandfather's wellness magazine. So clearly I had a great interest. So when we did the first PBS special on how to invest in homes and change your future, the PBS team and I talked about this idea and we came up with Life 201. So Life 201, for most of you who have watched the show, is about the three pillars of life. We call it fuel, what we eat, what we drink, what we breathe, what we put on our skin. Feel how we move and then fun. Because if we follow the advice of the great experts and we do the movements and we eat right, we could live a long life and then we would like to be able to finance it. So we talk about fuel, feel and fun. We have five great experts to share with you today. Yes, it's not gonna be on a live stage, but you will be able to ask questions and on your screen, hopefully you will see that there is a way for you to uh, go to the bottom, scroll to the bottom, and you see there is Q&A, there is chat, so you can post questions and the experts will be speaking to you and replying to them. <clears throat> the great experts we have today for you are, we start with, on the show, we called it Neuro Movement. And Neuro Movement is a method that I demonstrated on the show. We had a guest expert on the show that I channeled their information by the name of Anat Baniel. And Neuro Movement was developed from the work of Moshe Feldenkrais. Some of you may know that system by the name Feldenkrais. His ace student, Anat Baniel, took it her own direction and labeled her work Neural Movement. So our first speaker today will be Carla Oswald Reed, who is a very long-term practitioner of the Feldenkrais method the neuro movement method. I was fortunate enough to be able to work with Carla, <clears throat> and I think it's going to be a treat. 
I also hope that she will teach us some specific moves to do which can improve our lives, just like we did on the show. Then we are going to have <clears throat> Dr. John Sutterry. John is a, an incredible researcher who is always on top of what to supplement with, mistakes we can make. I have shared on the show the mistake that many of us make with vitamin E and taking the wrong kind. Well, John's going to be here live on this Zoom call to share with us the latest and needless to say, he will be referring to the crisis that we all are in, the coronavirus, or as some people like to call it, the COVID-19. So we're going to learn some very practical and tangible information from John, teaching us how to minimize the risk of infection, uh, strengthen the way that we deal with it if we get infected. And then the next person is Holly Tsing. And Holly is a founder of the, the American website for Chinese reflexology. I was fortunate enough to get her work one-on-one -on -one when we still could do that, when we weren't sheltering at home, and I was blown away. Luckily, she put her work in a way that we can do it ourselves at home. She has a great book, so we're going to learn from her, and I'm sure also some of the pointers, no pun intended, she will show us points, that we get from her will help us deal with the situation. And then I will be talking about investing because I do feel that even these days we need to have our eyes open. Many of us are really struggling. <clears throat> people who are not employed all of a sudden, people who thought they could work from home and they can't. So I will be talking about the financial sides of the coronavirus crisis and also in general, how to change our future with some of the most powerful things we can do in life. And I will be talking about that. And then we have Dr. You know, Andrea Rene, who is a, <clears throat> who's an acupuncturist, an integrated doctor, and she will be loading us with information about strengthening our immune system, doing simple yet effective things to keep our health going. So all of those great experts, I feel very fortunate to have here. I myself, just as a listener to the show, can't wait to learn myself. I think there is a lot to learn for me. I think there's a lot to learn for you. And I hope that we can all benefit a great deal from the content and the information that we have here. Uh, <clears throat> just in case you have any questions so far about the structure of how it's going to be, uh, please, you can share it with us either via a chat or a Q&A. We have begun this at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and we will finish at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard, <clears throat> where each one of the experts will speak for a roughly 30 or 35 minutes. That's you know an approximate thing. And we will have plenty of time for Q&A. I think it's gonna be quite good. And hopefully some of your friends or people who want to watch it later might be able to see, probably will be able to see the recording. So <clears throat> on the show itself, on Life 201, we had a yoga teacher, we had a neuro movement specialist, and I demo, you know, I demonstrated a simple move that really made a huge difference. Remember how when people could reach a foot more in about 20 seconds without trying hard or stretching hard. That was remarkable. Dr. John Sottery was on Life 201, the show. We're so proud and happy that he will be here. The people who will meet today 
Holly and Dr. Rene are new. They were not on the show, but they are absolutely loaded with information. And as I said, our first presenter, Carla, is a long-term student, and we are going to learn a lot from her as well. So this should be a very fulfilling uh, session, a fulfilling webinar. I hope that you are doing well. If you are sheltering at home, I hope you are not going stir crazy. I hope that your businesses and or your jobs are still in effect. And if they're not, I will certainly talk about some of the government programs under CARES, C-A-R-E-S, such as, of course, what we all know, the extended and enhanced unemployment benefits, but many other things, including I just actually, just before I hopped on the line here, I recorded a video on the forbearance program for people who may be suffering from the COVID-19 crisis and would like a forbearance on their mortgage. Most of them can have it. I talk about it in that video and I'll talk later on how to find it, how to, sh how to share it with you so you can benefit from it as well. But uh, <clears throat> before we do that, I would like to uh, talk about uh, our first speaker. So uh, we went in a very simple way. We simply went to the people who are on the East Coast and put them on first. And then we put the speakers who are on the West Coast. So Holly, Dr. Rene, and myself are on the West Coast. You see the Golden Gate Bridge here. Carla and John are on the East Coast. And so needless to say, they will be starting uh, today and Carla will be the first one. So Carla Oswald Reed has been teaching individuals for decades now how to move, think and feel differently by using the capacity of our brain to change. Our brains are flexible. They have plasticity. They can change. We demonstrated on Life 201, the show, some simple things and Carla, of course, will go deeper. She used to be a physical therapist, and for 50 years, she has been transforming the lives of people. She trained with Moshe Feldenkrais, personally, one-on-one -on -one in the course, and she's been an amazing teacher. She works with kids, and she also learned the neural movement with the Life 201 participant, and not Baniel. So it gives me great pleasure to see, and I would like to see if we have Carla on. Oh, we do, Carla, it's lovely to see you. Thank, Thank you. you very much for joining us today. So without further ado, I'm gonna give it up to Carla Oswald Reed. Carla, thank you. Thank you. Well, I was going to say good afternoon, everyone, but for some of you, it's afternoon. For some of you, it's already evening. Um, in Adiel's PBS Life 201 presentation, as he said, he introduced you to the neural movement approach of Nat Banya, one of those relevant experts for his pillar he calls feel. I'm thrilled to have this opportunity to share with you some other simple ways that you can use neural movement to increase your well being by revealing the potent resource that you have hidden between your ears, your own brain. In this um, <clears throat> stressful time of dealing with the pandemic of the coronavirus, we're all likely to have more tension than usual and less access to the best resources to help ourselves. So it's great to have some tools that you can use. As he said, I trained as a physical therapist five decades ago because I wanted to work with children with brain injuries. At that time, it was still considered fact that our brains were a fixed commodity. We used to think we were born with our IQ and that if you suffered a brain injury, you were just sentenced to live with a disability about which you could do little or nothing. 
uh, hopefully you are fortunate enough not to have any disability, but all of us have uh, experienced episodes of achy joints, muscle spasm, pain, or difficulty learning a new skill or, or improving an old one. Which of these is your most important concern? Because now is a very exciting time to live because research has documented extensively that our brains can change every day until we die, which has been termed neuroplasticity. At UCSF, a team of neuroscientists working with Michael Merzenich have done the bulk of the basic science research that supports neuroplasticity. But there's also clear evidence of neuroplasticity is just among the children born with Down syndrome. Children with Down syndrome always have three 21st chromosomes instead of the typical two, which can interfere with them spontaneously initiating the usual developmental milestones. Since their genetic profile has never changed, they can be seen as their own control group over time. 100 years ago, babies with Down syndrome were usually placed in an institution for the mentally defective, a term we don't even use anymore, where they often received minimal stimulation and, and minimal TLC, and often did not learn to walk, talk, or care for themselves. But now, babies born with Down syndrome usually stay at home with their families, and their families receive professional advice from early intervention programs. And now there are individuals who have Down syndrome who become professional actors, models, and sometimes competitive gymnasts. They learn to play the piano and attend school and inclusion classrooms with their same age peers. Have you ever thought about what that means? The only thing that changed with children with Down syndrome is their experience. Their genetics is still the same. And that experience helped create an entirely different trajectory for their lives by structuring their brains more like typical babies structure theirs. It's the tailoring of experience to optimize learning that's my chosen work with children with special needs. I call it making every movement count. But what does neuroplasticity have to do with you? By tailoring your experiences, you can tap the neuroplasticity of your brain to, to have and be what you want. If you have a child or grandchild whose developmental learning is stalled by any condition or injury, you can learn how that child can thrive beyond all expectations by making every movement count for that child. But what's the history of the concept of neuroplasticity? Ariel alluded to it. It's a, a Russian Im Ukraine immigrant to Israel named Moshe Feldenkrais figured out about 80 years ago, before the term neuroplasticity was even coined, that our brains changed in response to our experiences. His history, and that of many other innovators in neuroplasticity, is in a book called *The Brain's Way of Change*, uh, *The Brain's Way of Healing*, by Norman Deutsch. It's available on Amazon and elsewhere. But Dr. Feldenkrais was a professional engineer, physicist, the first Westerner with a black belt in judo, but he had a knee injury. His successful experimentation with his own movements to improve his function inspired him to create a whole new profession. He watched the rapid learning of typical babies and speculated that our rate of learning does not need to stop as we grow older or slow down. He noted that babies explored many variations of movement with constant sensory attention to what they're feeling. He noticed that most adults were using the same habits over their whole lifetime that they developed during the first 12 to 18 months of life and seemed unable to change habits when they encountered difficulties. So over several decades, Dr. Feldenkrais generated and recorded over 600 movement lessons using his language to guide people to experiment with variations of movement 
while attending to the perception of the differences in how they felt with each variation. He found that their brains spontaneously utilized whatever variations were the most comfortable and the most effective, and that their learning was just as rapid and dynamic as typical infants. Many adults spontaneously changed their habits in ways that improved their skills or recovered their function after interference from any disease or injury. My passion for finding the most effective ways to help children with brain injuries led me to complete a professional training program with Dr. Feldenkrais in the early 1980s before he passed on in 1984. After my four children were grown, I studied in the early 2000s with Anat Bunyal. She was the personal assistant and protege of Dr. Feldenkrais for his last 11 years. I eventually assisted Anat in her professional training programs through 2016. And that's where I met Adiel. The teachings of Dr. Feldenkrais and Anat Bunyal completely transformed how I practice as a physical therapist with adults or children. I call what I do a dynamic systems approach to motor learning. Why a systems approach? Because the organic learning of the Feldenkrais method and the Anak Banyel method of neural movement always involve addressing how every part of an individual's body and self is participating in any action. I've also learned how to change my own habits of thinking, feeling, and moving so that I continue to age gracefully at 72. <laughs> Individuals certified in a training with Dr. Feldenkrais or the generations of trainers since he passed on are called Feldenkrais practitioners and they can be located at feldenkrais.com. Anat Banyel branded her evolution of what she learned from Dr. Feldenkrais as the Anat Banyel method of neural movement and practitioners certified by her can be located at the anatbanyelmethod.com or neuroconnect.world. But let's talk about this business of habits a bit more so I can give you some of the tips I promised. We could explore some common habits right now that you're probably not even aware you have. So move with me here and just consider, interlace the fingers of your hands. And notice which one of your thumbs is on top. Now slowly separate your hands and interlace them again so the other thumb is on top. And then just look at your hands and see what did you really do? If you change the interlacing accurately, all of the fingers will have moved over one. Some people just move the thumbs and don't change the rest of the fingers. So how does it feel to interlace your fingers a way that is non-habitual? If it feels strange or awkward, it's because even such a small movement as interlacing your hands the non-habitual way requires your brain to make a small change in how every part of your body is participating in that action. A non-habitual movement is any movement you don't usually do, which provides an occasion for your brain to reshuffle all the bits that go into moving so that a better way of moving can be organized. To use a computer metaphor, moving non-habitually puts your brain on search to find a way to do what you don't usually do. Now, let's consider what you can do if your back's in spasm or your joints are aching. Your habitual patterns of movement may have often knowing, unknowingly contributed to whatever muscle spasm or pain you experience. But if you get a backache or you have a bout of sciatic pain, you can, you can try walking backwards around the house for a few minutes. Okay, just backwards. Mm -hmm. You can even try walking down the stairs backwards, but I recommend you hold the railing for safety. I've been fortunate to rarely have pain, but when I occasionally get a hint of sciatica, walking backwards down the stairs almost always gets my pain to disappear. People with more established trouble may need more sophisticated strategies to untangle their stuck patterns, 
they can access that with a practitioner. If you try walking backwards for a bit and then you return to walking forward, your brain will utilize the data from how it organized for you to walk backwards to integrate into a better way of walking forward again. But let's get back to understanding how and why this works. Dr. Feldenkrais became aware that when one is moving attentively, the movement involves more parts of the brain at the same time than anything we do that involves little or no body movement, you know, like watching TV or reading or listening to music. Therefore, he stated that movement is the language of the brain because he found that movement is the most effective way to get the brain to generate new neural connections. Anup Banyel identified crucial qualities of movement necessary to get the brain to make those new connections in what she calls the nine essentials. And you can read more about that in either of the books she's written, Move Into Life or Kids Beyond Limits. Move Into Life about the, uh, working with adults and Kids Beyond Limits about children with special needs. They, of course, are also available on Amazon. How do these nine essentials differ from our usual ideas about exercise? Well, in usual calisthenics or working out, one usually repeats exactly the same movement many times, uh, often mindlessly while we listen to audio books or music or watch entertainment if we're on those machines in the, in the exercise places. Many people do the movements very fast and often use the maximum effort they can muster. But to enlist your neuroplasticity, you want the brain's attention. So the movements are done with the nine essentials, slowly, while noticing how one feels as one is moving, with the least amount of effort, never to the point of causing discomfort or pain, and always with variations of movement each time you do it. Sometimes movements are done only in the imagination or guided by using images. Here's a little something you can do for yourself that's a taste of what you can experience in group movement classes taught by practitioners. Have you ever had a stiff neck or a pain in the neck or wake up with a wry neck? How can you get your brain's help to relieve your discomfort in your neck? I'm going to experiment with that. So turn your head slowly to your left. Just as far as it goes easily, so slowly with the least amount of effort, uh, never to the point of discomfort, and return to the front and, and do that just a few times and notice where in your spine or where in other parts of your body do you feel the movement. Backwards in. Uh, <clears throat> and as you repeat that a few times, stop whenever you return to face the front and have a deep breath before you move again. Now turn your head to the right a few times. And just the same way you did it on the other side, just notice how comfortable you feel doing that to each side and how far you turn easily without trying hard. Now place your left hand on top of your head, just lightly, so that you can create one unit of your head and your arm and move them together. So turn the unit of your head and your arm slowly and easily again to your left and return to face forward. And just do that a few times so you can notice if and where you feel the movement in your spine while you're turning. And after you've done it about three times, maybe stop when you're facing forward again. And now keep your hand on your head, but focus your eyes on some object or spot on the wall directly in front of you. And continue to look forward at that object with your eyes while you slowly turn your head 
and your arm as a unit a few times again to your left. And each time, return your head and your arm to join your eyes facing forward. You just do that a few more times. Keep your eyes forward as your head and your arm turn as a unit to your left. And after you've done that a few times, just bring your hand down from your head and pause and take a breath. And notice whether you feel any difference between your right and left sides of your neck, or maybe even in the muscles in your face or in the rest of your body. Now, without your hand on your head, initiate turning your head to your left. What difference do you notice in how far you turn easily now or where in your spine you feel the movement compared to how you felt it when you started? Now turn your head to the right. Is it more comfortable to turn your head to your right or to your left? To which side do you turn your head further with the same ease? An interesting experiment, eh? To explain it a bit, it's non-habitual to move your head and your arm as one unit. And it's non-habitual for you to keep your eyes still when you turn your head. Moving your head and your arm as one unit puts your neck on vacation. You see, when I go like this, the movement is not in those vertebrae of my neck. So it makes it necessary to distribute the movement through more of the vertebrae of your spine. Moving in this non-habitual way gives your brain information to reshuffle how you use yourself when you turn your head without your hand on your head. You have many more habits than you realize. I could just give you a few examples, picking up your glass or your coffee cup with always the same hand. Uh, do you always sleep on the same side of your bed? Do you always pick up your phone with the same hand and listen with the same ear? You can use the strategy of doing things non-habitually to improve lots of skills too, such as your score in tennis or bowling or some other sport. You know, the common approach to trying to improve a skill is to keep trying harder or practicing the same thing over and over. But Einstein once said, that the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. So how else could we do it? How can we practice variations to improve our game? What if you play a game with the racket or the bowling ball in your non-dominant, non-habitual hand? I guarantee it will likely feel quite awkward and you'll probably score really poorly. And you have to have patience with that because of the gain you can get. Because I also expect that when you play the next game with the racket or the bowling ball in your habitual hand, you will find that your skill has improved because your brain will use the data from your experiment with your non-dominant hand to find better ways to use your dominant hand. Here's an example from my work with children. What can you do if you have a child or a grandchild who has cerebral palsy with arms or legs so stiff you can hardly move them? What I'll share with you applies both to children with CP and to adults who've had a traumatic brain injury or lost control of movement on one side of the body from a stroke. The children with CP and the adults after stroke or brain injury both tend to hold their arm in a intensely bent position at the shoulder, elbow, wrist, and fingers, which interferes with their attempts to move intentionally. Caregivers and some physical or occupational therapists often approach this issue by pulling on the stiff arm and hand to try to force or stretch the arm to lift it at the shoulder, extend it at the elbow and wrist, and try to pull the fingers open. This strategy is often uncomfortable for the child or the adult, 
And there's often little success in loosening up the arm or keeping the hand open. When I face this challenge, I look to making every movement count. I, I have the child's arm wherever it is, and I begin to move it against the child's own ribs and abdomen or torso in, in whatever trajectory I can access, various trajectories, to just give the brain more information about where that arm is. They don't know much about it because they don't get much experience moving it. The child's brain usually responds by spontaneously decreasing the excessive muscular contractions that have kept the arm from being moved. And gradually, I can usually slide the child's arm down toward the pelvis until I can slide the child's hand behind the child's pelvis, a place the arm usually has never been. The child's brain has no habit of holding the arm in the usual spastic bent position, posture in this position. So, so the child's brain often spontaneously opens the fingers and dramatically decreases those contractions of the muscles around the shoulder, the elbow, and the wrist. This strategy, of course, can also be applied to an adult who's had a stroke or a brain injury. When the adult's or child's arm stops being stiff, more functional movements are possible that help the brain make new neural connections and change the person's self-perception or internalized map in the brain of their own arm and hand and its relation to the rest of the self. Well, this has been a lot of complex ideas for you to process. When we work as practitioners, it's actually a great deal more complex than these simple tips I've given you to experience. But I hope it's provided you with an introduction to the limitless possibilities of neuroplasticity. Practitioners teach group movement classes and offer hands-on sessions with individuals. It gives me great joy to bring my making every movement count to children whose parents have been told what the child will never do. I love to rewrite whatever book they've been uh, led to believe. You can access my practice at movementtowholeness.com to optimize the learning and improve the function of your children or grandchildren if they have special needs. You can use your own neuroplasticity to manage the stress of the current pandemic and create the life you want and find how to age in a way that you can continue to do what you want with ease and comfort. Oh, in the midst of this uh, coronavirus, I've also begun to do remote consultations. Anyway, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, before, you like, before you leave, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, first I want to thank you. You gave us some wonderful, specific things to do, which I absolutely love. And um, even the tip about if you experience a certain type of back pain or something like that, just the simple act of carefully going down the stairs backwards mm -hmm. and reorganize the movement when we then go forward. And your example with the movement of the head and the arm and the eyes, lovely, really, just in closing, is there one move that we at home, all the tense, depressed uh, people, is there one little thing we can do or you think that those two are great? I kind of can't wait to go over to my stairs and start going, <laughs> going downwards, backwards. Well, uh, certainly when we teach group classes and we do one-on-one -on -one sessions, we're able to help people you know, get deeper difficulties resolved. Um, but on your own, I, uh, I thought a lot about it ahead of time and the two best ones I could think of for you were just to walk backwards when you feel a little stuck. And so many people get neck pain or wake up with a wry neck and spend the whole day not being able to turn their head. So I wanted to share that possibility of, of working with the, the head and neck in a different way that can shift your stuck places. That is wonderful. That's what I love about this method. And that's why I myself learn how to be a teacher because with a specific and simple movement, you actually change, you know, the way that you move, that you do things. So thank you so much. I would like to mention also in the Life 201 book, 
and videos. Uh, Anat Baniel, who was our guest on the show, has a chapter and a video chapter. So those of you that are here because you donated to PBS, please check those out. Carla, I want to thank you so much. It's been extremely wonderful. Thank you for having me. This has been fun. And uh, it's been a, an interesting challenge to, to speak to all of you with adult issues when my passion is so strongly about working with the children. You evoked the child in us. That's only good. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Carla.